All right, let's get started. We're going to start in prayer. Go ahead and stay seated. I'm going to kneel. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that you have given me to give this presentation. I pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts to receive not only the intellectual information, but that the information would go from our mind to our hearts, transform us from the inside out, give us the, the tools to declare the truth of your existence and the wisdom to love those around us and to express your amazing love and forgiveness that you've given us. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> So this has been the theme of the presentation. This is eternal life that they may know. That is, intimately have knowledge. Friendship. More than friendship, it's intimacy. Like a husband and wife. That they may have a relationship with you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So last week we stopped off on the math. I want to pick right back up and continue going where we left off. <clears throat> the, the divine ratio, the divine sequence. So let's ask a question. If God really did create the heavens and the earth and everything in it, then we should see his fingerprints, uh, a record of the intellectual being that created everything. So when we look at nature, we do find this this in one way, a mathematical sequence called the Fibonacci sequence or the divine ratio. Now, the divine ratio is 1.618. So we can take that and lay it out in the two different, in the red and yellow here, and you can see there's 0.618 and 1. So that is the divine ratio and the ratio between them, 1.618. Well, we can do the same thing in the vertical right here like this. And we can also continue it around and do it the other way. And it will continue to go in a spiral pattern. You can also do it with cubes. So you take the one, the, the, the numerical numbers are one, one, two, three, five, eight. You take one and one, one plus one is two. So you have a two by two square. Two plus one is three. So you have a three by three square. Three plus two is five. So you have a five by five square. 3 plus 5 is 8, so you have an 8 by 5, or an 8 by 8 square. So you have these squares, and they actually go in a spiraling pattern. Can you see that? You can take a spiral and literally graph that out. I call this the divine ratio in motion. The divine ratio in motion. We find it all over nature. We find it everywhere. I'm going to race through a few of these pictures. It's absolutely astonishing, by the way, you know, the three and the eight that are found, or the three and the five that are found in the sequence of numbers. Well, when you break into a banana, or you cut a banana in half, you'll notice that it, that it naturally parts into three different sections. Well, the outside, the skin layer, actually has five different sections, so that it very nicely fits into your hand, by the way. Like a designer designed it to fit right inside the hand. So you have these two numbers, three and five. In the, in the banana. You can also see the spirals there of the tail and the plants there. Absolutely astonishing. You look at a pine cone and a pine cone, you count the spirals one way and you've literally got 13 spirals. You count the spirals the other way and you have eight. Both of those are Fibonacci sequences and you also have the spiral that goes up the pine cone. Very fascinating that you find this spiral everywhere. <clears throat> this is an interesting, it's actually called the Fibonacci uh, broccoli because you can see here that it's got the patterns. If you can see this pattern right here, you can see the, the, the coil, the sequence right here, spins and spins and spins. But what's fascinating is when you zoom up, it also does the same thing. Each individual piece has the same spin. And if you count them, it counts up to 8 and 13 divine numbers. You see the same shape in an egg, you see the same shape in an ear, and the eardrum, seashells, fingerprints. You know, I was talking uh, last week about how the, index, the first section of the finger and the second section of the finger is 1.618 in difference. If you actually make a fist, 
you have this same spiraling fashion that's imprinted right in the hand. It's the same mathematics expressed differently. A fetus has the same basic shape as a shell does, that same spiraling shape. All different types of shells have this same mathematics, cauliflower and cabbage. So what's interesting about the cauliflower, the pink and green there, is you can isolate just like the other cabbage, you can or cauliflower, you can isolate one section and see that there's spirals inside that section. It's very fascinating how many different places you can see this number. Plants everywhere express this number. It's overwhelming, the division of a cell, the trunk of an elephant, insects, and the horn, the way that plants grow. Now, if I asked you if this, as a public statement, was created, if you could see a designer there, there would be a huge debate. But if I said if you could see a designer there, there would be no debate. A little five-year-old child could tell you that this was designed. Somebody made this. And I promise you, this is the ovary of an anglefish. Somebody made this. This wasn't randomly put together. Even the waves of the water follow the same mathematics. When it's swirling down the drain, it follows the same mathematics. When you throw it in the air, it follows the same mathematics. This math is all through nature. Everywhere you look, you see the divine ratio in motion. In the clouds and storms in the sky, when airplanes drop, travel through them, you can see the swirling. If you have a fireplace and you have some smoke and you just run your hand through it, you'll see the swirls. You see them everywhere. This clearly was made by an intelligent designer. This clearly was made by an intelligent designer. The math is all through the universe. Romans, 1, Romans chapter 1 verse 20 is absolutely correct when it says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things which have been made. Now, we see this number all over the place, but we also see it, I want to talk about the pentagram. The pentagram was originally God's, not Satan's, although he's taken this mathematical perfection and turned it to his own demise, but it's 1.618, which makes this amazing shape. You can actually find the ratio all over the place and every different angle on there. You can also find the same principles that it's an infinite an infinite uh, shape that it can infinitely go into itself. You can put a pentagram inside a pentagram inside a pentagram inside a pentagram, just like the divine ratio in sequence <clears throat> or in motion. Every place you see, and this same mathematics is represented in nature. So here we see it in the starfish. Here's another starfish. Beautiful mathematics. Absolutely astounding. Same mathematics, different shape. Absolutely astounding. This did not happen by accident. When you slice open an apple, you can see the seeds are laid out. Flowers are laid out in the same shape. All over the world, we have fruit that has this same shape. This is clearly a shape that God ordained. It's a mathematical wonder. Not only this we have with the divine code, but we also have this angle. And it's imprinted, and not only do we see it in nature everywhere, but it's imprinted in our mind. It's a computer program that's been programmed in our brain so that when I look at you and I look at nature, my brain recognizes the math and receives it as being good and pleasing. Forensic science. Forensic science basically says whether things are going, whether they are what they are. If God created the heavens and the earth, we should see his fingerprints, his mind throughout all nature. And this is exactly what we see in mathematics. Now, I don't know if you're aware of Nikola Tesla, but he's a mathematician, engineer, and inventor. He actually holds 111 patents in the United States, 300 patents worldwide. There are many, many things that we hold in this wonderful world that we uh, in this new age electronic world that we have today that we owe to him, and many people don't even know his name. He's been an inventor and an engineer ever since his youth, all the way through his old age. Here are some interesting facts about where Nikola Tesla got the ideas from 
a lot of amazing things that he has invented. This story was written by Tesla himself, and you will know that in this story, that Tesla gives his full credit to God for his ability to discover some new amazing, some amazing new ideas in the Bible. Hmm. Amazing new ideas in the Bible. As I have mentioned before, he says, the microwave comes from chapter 4 in Revelation. There's a throne room, and there's an image that's given of the throne room, and from that image, Nikola Tesla saw electricity, and he came up with the concept of the microwave. He also invented alternating current. There's one of the first te of Tesla's um, AC motors. When he saw Niagara Falls, the first thing he thought of was a hydro turbine so that he could generate electricity from water, and what do you know, there's one existing there today. Thanks, Nikola. In many places in his work, Tesla mentions the fact that that he was inspired by the Bible study to conceive of these amazing, of his amazing ideas. His idea for alternating current comes from the book of Matthew. In other words, the Trinity. He invented wireless electronic or uh, wireless electricity communication from one place to another, going wirelessly. He called it the Tesla coil. He admitted he was also known as the master of lightning, the master of lightning he was called. Nikola Tesla himself said, the gift of the mental power comes from God, divine being, and if we can concentrate our minds on the truth, we become in tune with his great power. My mother's taught me to seek all truth in the Bible. Amen, Brother Tesla. All truth is in the Bible. Nikola Tesla, he was the first inventor of the remote control vehicle. He had a remote control boat that he ran and it was, people were so astonished. He actually had to open the boat to show everybody there was no little men in there because everybody was so convinced that somebody was in the boat running it while he was pretending like he was doing it. Absolutely astonishing man. He used to say that if you wish to understand the universe, think of energy, frequency, and vibration, Nikola Tesla would say. One of the amazing things Nikola Tesla did is he actually lit up in 1899 over 200 light bulbs wirelessly over a 24 mile span. Absolutely amazing. When Nikola Tesla said that when wireless is perfectly applied, the whole earth will be, will be converted into a huge brain, which in fact it is. All things being particles of a real and rhythmic whole, we shall be able to communicate with one another instantly, irrespective of distance. Not only this, but through the television and telephony, we shall see and hear one another as perfectly as though we were face to face, despite intervening distances of thousands of miles. And the instruments through which we shall be able to do this will fit inside a vest pocket. It was, this statement was made in 1929. Amazing, amazing man, Nikola Tesla. Let's specifically talk about some numbers. The only reason I even mentioned Tesla is because one of his quotes is, one of Nikola Tesla's quotes is, if you knew the magnificence of 3, 6, and 9, then you would have the key to the universe. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about the number 9. We've been talking about mathematics in the universe, and so I just want to spend a little time on 9. If you notice, the number 9 follows the same pattern in visuals as the divine ratio, and so does 6, as a matter of fact. And when you actually line up 1, 6, and 9, they are the most numerically accurate to 1.618. So number nine, it's absolutely astonishing the number nine. You can actually find nine everywhere. Let me explain. If you took a number, say 25, and you did just a mathematical sequence to it, it would all go back to 20, or back to nine. Every number in the universe over nine goes back to nine. Let me demonstrate. 25. If you take 25 and you add them together, two plus five equals seven. Two plus five equals seven. Twenty-five, the original number, minus the total, seven, equals eighteen. You add the two together, one plus eight equals nine. So the number is nine. What about fifty-six? 
Same thing, if we take 5 plus 6 is 11. 56 minus 11 is 45. 4 plus 5 equals 9. So let's do a bigger number, 699. If you take 699 and add them together, 6 plus 9 plus 9 equals 24. 699 minus 24 is 675. 6 plus 7 plus 5 is 18. If you take 1 plus 8, it equals 9. It all goes back to 9. What about 360 degrees? 360 degrees. 3 plus 6 plus 0 is 9. What about 180 degrees? 1 plus 8 plus 0 is 9. What about 90 degrees? 9 plus 0 is 9. What about 45 degrees? 4 plus 5 is 9. This is absolutely astonishing. 22.5 degrees comes back to 9. How about 60 degrees? Well, you have 3 60 degrees. So 60 times 3 equals 180. 1 plus 8 plus 0 is 9. <clears throat> 90 with the four corners, 9 times 4 is 360, 3 plus 6 plus 0 is 9, of course. How about 108 degrees or 120 degrees, it goes back to 9. 140 degrees or 144 degrees goes back to 9. As a matter of fact, if you add all the numbers up to 9 together, they will equal 9. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 is 36. 3 plus 6 is 9. So what's fascinating is if you take 9 and you plus any digit, it automatically returns back to its original digit. So you take 9 plus 6 equals 15. 1 plus 5 is 6. You can do this to any number. Take 1 plus 4. It's 13. 1 plus 3 is 4. Now, if there's any homeschooling parents out there that like running around doing math with their kids, these are great mental exercises to, to help your child develop the ability to do math and, and uh, higher level thinking in his mind. <clears throat> Not only this, but so 9 quite literally equals all the numbers, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, remember, equal 9. And all the numbers past that go back to 9. So all numbers literally equal 9 and 0 all at the same time. Nothing. Huh. 9 is an amazing, amazing mathematical number, and I've just, I've just skipped across the top. The earth is the Lord's and all of his. And if he created it, we should see his fingerprints and his brush marks all over the universe. The laws of physics and the laws of cosmology is exactly what we need for life. Precisely and exactly what we need for life. If it was just slightly different or slightly off, everything would cease to exist and life could not be. It's like a big house of cards, each one precariously balanced on top of the next with, with a great uh, symphony of complexity. Our galaxy, we are specifically placed in our galaxy. Galaxy is a huge spiral of stars, and there's only this span of green area, of living area, that life can exist inside this. If it's too close, gravity would literally crush. If it was too far away, everything would, would fly out. There's this only this thin layer of life zone in our galaxy that we can actually be. Not only this, but we're right in the exact same and exact place for us to see out of, out of our galaxy to see the stars and observe the rest of the universe. We are precisely balanced. Our sun is extremely stable, which other suns are not very stable. It's only by it's only varied by 0.1% over 11 years that we've watched the spot the sunspot cycle. It's exactly the right brightness. It's exactly the right spectrum. Otherwise, life couldn't exist. Contrary to the Copernican principle, which means all the suns out there are pretty much the same, our sun, the sun, is not just a common star, but has properties making it unique to our planet, therefore causing the planet to be able to be habitable. It's a, their sun is perfectly spaced, perfectly sized, it is exactly the right size. The very smallest dot you can see on this is our sun, compared to all the other suns. 
Our sun is perfectly sized, perfectly placed, the perfect spectrum for, to, for life to exist on our planet. Things are starting to stack up as the house of cards. Not only this, but the earth is perfectly distanced from the sun to allow life. If it was a little bit closer, water wouldn't be able to exist here in the liquid form. And if it was a little bit further away, water would gasify and it would leave. So the earth is exactly where it needs to be to have life. Not only this, but the earth is terrestrial. It means that it's earth, it's, it's dirt, it's a big rock, the third rock from the sun. It's not supposed to have water. The way that evolution has explained things to have happened, it is impossible for water to exist on Earth. Yet, a lot of water exists on Earth. We find it in the mantle, we find it in the crust, we find it on the surface of the crust. We find water everywhere, but it's not supposed to be here. It was my science that drove me to the conclusion that the world is much more complicated than we it can, can with, is much more complicated than can be explained by science. It is only through the supernatural that I can understand the mystery of existence. Let's take water for just for a second and talk about it in the physics. So the water molecule is a very unique and special water molecule. It actually defies physics. Water defies physics. Now let me explain. Everything in physics, when it gets hot, it goes up. So when a hot air balloon is filled with heat, it goes up. That's why hot air balloons go up. When things get cold, they sink, they go down. So according to physics, when water freezes, it should be on the bottom, which would destroy all the plant life, which would then destroy all the bugs in the water, which would then destroy all the fish, which, you know the gist, just spirals down until everything is destroyed. If water didn't defy physics and float, life could not exist. Things are very delicately balanced. We came to the conclusion that if you would create planets from a uniform disk of planetesimals, the simulated bombardment leaves a growing planet spinning once a week at the most, not once a day. So this, the fact that our planet spins 24 hours a day contradicts evolution. A thousand miles an hour, our planet rotates. Something had to start this spinning off. Tops just don't start spinning by themselves. They have to have something that started it. If it was any faster, the heat would destroy us. And if it was any slower, the cold would destroy us. It, it's literally, not only does it have to be in a thousand miles an hour, 24 hour day, but evolution cannot predict that and says that it should not be that. The size of the moon and the distance away from the earth is exactly precise. If we didn't have a moon and it wasn't exactly the distance, we wouldn't have tides. Without tides, you wouldn't have oxygenation in the water, without in the oceans, and you wouldn't have the heat and the cool cycles, so all the oceans would be dead. And of course, the chain goes down the road. If the oceans are dead, life is dead. When we went to Apollo, and Apollo or when we went to the moon in Apollo 17, we brought back some moon specimens and had it tested, and it actually cast doubt on the lunar origins. NASA says this: we still need more data and perhaps some new theories before the origin of the moon is settled to everyone's satisfaction, because the origin of the moon is not explained in the evolutionary concept. They have no explanation for it. Creationists do, of course. The Earth's location, its size, its composition, its structure, its atmosphere, its temperature, its many intricate cycles are essential to the life. The carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the sodium cycle, and so on, testify to the degree to, the degree to which our planet is exquisitely and precariously balanced. The Earth is, our solar system is perfectly tuned like a clock. As a matter of fact, Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, has such an immense gravitational field that it draws in all the asteroids, or at least most of the asteroids, so that it hits them and not us. The Jupiter itself spins once every 10 hours. A complete rotation, as large as it is, the largest planet in the solar system, spins around once every 10 hours, and we can't explain how one every 
24 hours happens, let alone 1 every 10 hours, and this contradicts evolution. Not to mention the fact that evolution has no explanation as to how a gas giant can even exist and come to being in a solar system. Gas doesn't put off any gravity, therefore there's nothing to draw it. They just are completely confused how these gas giants can even exist. You know, that, there they are, staring back at us. This system is completely and delicately balanced. The carbon atom, the protons and the neutrons and the electrons and the interactions between them in order to create a, 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 a carbon atom is so precise that the longtime atheist Fred Hoyle said a common sense interpretation of the fact suggests that, the, that a super intelligent has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worthy of speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seems to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Everything is so delicately balanced there is no possible way that it could have happened by accident. This is exactly what they are saying. The Big Bang. The belief that there was nothing, and that nothing happened to nothing, and then nothing magically exploded for no reason, creating everything. And then a bunch of everything magically rearranged itself for no reason whatsoever into self-replicating bits, which then turned into dinosaurs. Make sense? Now I know this is a little bit of a mockery, but this is, this is exactly accurate to what the evolutionists are predicting. But there is always a cause for an effect. Whatever begins had a cause. That's just what we see, test, and observe. This is science. The first law of thermodynamics is that matter cannot, matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed. This is what science says. That's why Fred Hoyle had such an issue with his whole Big Bang theory that he named, by the way, when it first came out. Because if the universe had a beginning, then that means somebody started it. And he said, there's like this big bang, which is exactly what the Bible would predict. Fred Hoyle said the big bang theory requires a recent origin of the universe, and that openly invites the concept of creation. See, is what Fred Hoyle knew is that literally the word universe means a single spoken sentence. Uni, single. Verse, sentence. We live in a single spoken sentence. In the beginning, God said, Bang. The law of science tells us, Newton's laws tells us, with no outside forces, the object that is still will stay still. And with no outside forces, the object in motion will stay in motion. These are Newton's laws of motion. So everything that has a cause, the cause of the universe is outside space, time, and matter. Does that make sense? So whatever created this whole big thing is outside of it. The creator is never inside, but outside. Whoever created the computer is not in the computer. You're not going to find him in the computer. You're going to find him outside. He's bigger and outside of the computer. So whatever started, whatever caused this big bang, the origin of space, time, and matter, which, by the way, they all had to come into existence at the same time. If you had space, if you had matter and no space, where would you put it? If you had space and no matter or no time, when would you put it? You have to have all three of them at once in order for this to exist. And whatever started space, whatever started time, and whatever started matter is intellectually outside and above this. So intellectually, when we look at the Big Bang, we can come to the conclusion that God was the person who started it, whoever started it, was omnipotent, eternal, and immortal. And he had a personality because he chose to start it. He's omnipotent. He's everywhere at once. He invented space, therefore he's bigger than space. He's omnipotent. He invented time, therefore he's eternal. He's outside of time. He created matter, 
therefore he's outside, he's immaterial, he's outside of matter. And he's a personality because he chose to say, go. Had to be, intellectually. When I look at the night sky and I see the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. God is an amazing God. Let's talk a little bit more about laws. Let's say laws of gravity. Why is the law of gravity so weak? I mean, it is really weak. It's almost immeasurable. The electrical energy is incredible. Centrifugal force is incredibly strong. Why is gravity so weak? As a matter of fact, it's low, but it's precise. If gravity was just minutely different, gravity would be changed by a billion fold. It would crush everything. Life couldn't exist. Stephen Hawking says, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Hmm. Well, let's think about this for a second. So the universe says that everything came out of this disk of dust that was spinning around and around and around, and all these planets organized themselves into these planetesimals, these large asteroids, and then these asteroids came together to make planets. Once these planetesimals have been formed, further growth of the planets may occur through the gravitational accretion of these large bodies. Just how this takes place is not understood, because they would have to be so delicately placed together that they would literally have to be put there by somebody and not come together as an impact. The impact themselves would just blow the dust out and not produce planets. The formation of planets goes against what we can see, test, and demonstrate. Stephen Hawking is absolutely incorrect when he says because there's a law such as gravity, the universe can and will make itself. No, John Lennox said it right when he says nonsense remains nonsense even when talked by world-famous scientists. So let me explain this to you. Math, math is a law such as gravity. Math is a law and it completely dictates every transaction that takes place in my bank account. Everything that I do with my money is governed and predicted by math. But there's no amount of math that I can do. I can sit at home or go to the bank and I can put two plus three equal five and five dollars is not going to appear in my bank account. It's never going to happen. Mathematics does not create. Laws don't create. They ordain. Matter is not created by gravity. Laws can be descriptive and predictive about some things, but they can't design or create. The laws of nature produce no events. They state the pattern to which every event have only and can be induced to happen must conform. Just as the rules of arithmetic state the pattern to which all transactions with money must conform, if only you can get a hold of some money. For every law says that in the least resort, if you have A, then you will get B. But first catch your A. The laws won't do it for you. Let's talk about the electromagnetic field. The electromagnetic field is precisely balanced. If the electromagnetic field was not exactly the way it was, matter would just dissolve. It wouldn't hold together. Life would not exist. It is extraordinarily precise to be exactly where it is. Physicists, wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine tuning. They can't avoid it. Every place that they go to study, it just gets more complex and more complex and more complex every place they look. The difference in mass between neutrons and protons. If you increase the mass of a neutron by one part in 700, nuclear fusion would completely stop. Not only do the electrons have to be there, but they're precisely balanced and sized if they were just a little bit different. Matter could not exist. It wouldn't, things wouldn't work at all like they do now. The electrons were only... <clears throat> things are very delicately balanced. Astronomy leads us to a unique event in the universe, which was created out of nothing. 
one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the conditions required to permit life, and one which has and and one which has an underlining, one might say, supernatural plan. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Amen. Cause, the cosmological constant. Einstein discovered the cosmological constant. He said that it was, it's immensely, immensely, immensely fine-tuned. How fine-tuned? It's 0 0.02, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 123 zeros. An incredibly large number. Basically, it's 10 to the 123rd power. One in a trillion, 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 trillion. This is huge. There's only 10 to the 80 atoms in the entire universe. This number is immensely huge. It is so precisely balanced that the accuracy would be the equivalent of shooting an arrow. 14 billion years. Billion, 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 billion and hitting one millimeter. Never going to happen. It would be very difficult to explain why the universe should have begun in just this way, except as an act of a God who intended to create beings like us. The world-renowned atheist Stephen Hawking even admits by the end of 2001, astronomers identified more than 150 fine-tuned characteristics in the universe. This is an immensely complicated house of cards. The events which need an infinitely larger time than the estimated duration of the Earth can, it would seem to be, considered as impossible in the human sense. Our only three options for this intelligence that's found all around us is that it happened because it was necessary. I hear that a lot. Why is this this way? Well, it's that way because it needs to be that way. <laughs> that's not a reason. Or by chance. Well, it just, if you have a million monkeys typing on a typewriter, eventually one of them will write a book. No, no, it's not going to happen by chance. The only other option is design. Design. Necessary, chance, or design. Those are your three options. Let's watch a quick overview, a little clip, a little video clip called the watchmaker that goes over the start from the finish, this whole concept of intelligent design. A long time ago on a planet so bare, some water and dirt that mix up with the air. Some sand and some rocks to make it just right. The stage was all set in the deep of the night. A bolt of white lightning, a great peal of thunder. And suddenly there was a marvelous wonder. The rocks yielded metal, the sand turned to glass, and as the years flew, a new thing came to pass. The metal formed gears, the glass a watch face, and little by little things fell into place. The parts came together just like a good rhyme, with ticks and with tocks and with hands that tell time. A beautiful watch began ticking one day, formed all by itself in a wonderful way. Ridiculous story, you say with a grin. Impossible, laughable, surely a sin. A watch needs a watchmaker, that's plain to see. A designer and builder that makes it for me. Now all life is made of some interesting stuff. Cells of all shapes, like blobs filled with fluff. But looks are deceiving, and what we find there are factories and highways and gadgets to spare. Assembly lines, robots, electrical cable, libraries, software. Just look, if you're able. The marvels we see with a microscope stare make a watch look so simple. We dare not compare.
Now the doctors from Oxford say cells came by chance, from goo down to you, in a beautiful dance. What's wrong with their thinking to have such odd notions that cells could just happen from dirt and warm oceans? A cell and its wonders amaze all who see, and a cell like a watch by chance cannot be. Those cells can build hummingbirds, agile and free, bumblebees, snails, my backyard oak tree. A woodpecker built with a jackhammer nose, lightning bug, monkeys, a beautiful rose, and beetles with bombs that give frogs a surprise. Comedians with camouflage and some weird eyes. All nature on Earth is so perfectly fine. We have to admit that it's all by design, and our Maker owns everything, both great and small. He's the masterful watchmaker, Lord over all. fine-tuned, we couldn't even write down the number in full, since it would require more zeros than the number of elementary particles in the universe. Even though the odds, the probability, is so remote that this happened by chance, this is still the position that many atheists take. What do you think the chances are of, uh, a guy like you and a girl like me ending up together. Not good. You mean not good like one out of a hundred? I'd say more like one out of a million. So you're telling me there's a chance. of a designer by the impossibility of the contrary. Creation way outweighs evolution. Evolution doesn't have a, a speck of evidence in comparison to the overwhelming evidence that we were creating. If there is one universe, you have to have a fine tuner. But if you don't want God, you better have a multiverse. So this is how evolutionists have come out to fight against the complexity of the universe. As if there's just enough universes, going back to probability, trying to make the impossibility again a probable. They say there's a multiverse. Here's the issue. There is no evidence that there's a multiverse and there can never be evidence of a multiverse. By definition, you couldn't test it. So it defies science. Richard Swinburne said, multiple universe theory represents the height of irrationality. And that is absolutely correct. They say that there's a hundred million different universes out there. And you know, one of them seems by chance was right. Hmm. Anti-science. So basically it's what the multiverse says is that today everything has happened in your past exactly the way that it's happened all the way up to two hours ago when that cat ran across the road in front of you. And somewhere in the universe there was another place where instead of one cat running across the road there were ten. So in other words the multiverse theory says somewhere within the quantum foam of existence Amongst the very building blocks of reality, there is a universe where you are Batman. Science is what we can see, test, and demonstrate, not what we can hypothesize. For more on design, I highly recommend that you check out DetectingDesign.com or Turtles All the Way Down is a great book to check out. 
God's gospel. Let's look at the fine-tuning of God's gospel. God is love, and we've covered this over the last several presentations. In the Bible, God gave us a choice, a way to express our love for Him. He set up a tree with all the other trees that had good fruit and one that we weren't supposed to eat. And He said, if you eat it, you will die. Notice He didn't say, I will kill you if you eat it. No, that's not what He said. He said, if you eat this, the natural consequence is you will die, so don't do it. And of course, we didn't listen. We didn't trust Him. The serpent came, Satan, and he said, God is lying to you. He's a liar. He's restrictive and he's holding back all this goodness just for himself. He is self-preserving. He doesn't want you to be like him. And so the trust in the character of God was broken and she ate the fruit. Her trust in God was broken. The reaction to that was to eat the fruit. Eat the fruit. The sin was the sin was not eating the fruit. The sin was her trust in God was broke. The consequence of that was to eat the fruit. Genesis three eight. Jesus shows up to declare the rescue plan, and they hide in fear from God, which is exactly what people are doing still yet today are in fear of God. And He said, "No, I've come to give you a rescue plan," and He gave the sacrificial system. And he promised that Jesus was going to come and crush the head of the serpent, destroy him. The trust in God's character was broken, and the sacrificial system was given. Their relationship, their trust in God failed. So God went to Abraham to try to establish a faithful relationship with somebody. Notice all of these places are relationship, relationship. God just wants to have a relationship. And, of course, he made him a promise. He said, leave your country and your relatives and your fathers and your family and go to a land that I promise you. I will make you into a great nation. Now, Abraham didn't have any children yet. And so in order for him to be a great nation, he had to have some kids. So God was promising a child. And he says, all the families on the earth will be blessed in you. So Abraham lived for 10 more years with no children. And his wife came to him and said, you know, I think I know how we can help God fulfill his promise. Because he's obviously slow and he can't do it. So let's help him. Here's my wife, my servant. And so you can marry my servant and you guys can have a child. Thereby the child will be yours. We can help God fulfill his promise. And they did. And very shortly after the trust in God had broken and they tried to fulfill the promise by their own works, God said, I want to give you something to remind you that it's not by your works, but it's by my promise. What body part did Abraham use in order to break the promise of God in order to try to fulfill it? And he said, you're going to cut the tip of that thing off to remind you it's not by your works, not by you but by my promise. So God tried to have a trusting relationship with Abraham and it failed. But he still came through and gave him a son, Isaac. And at that point was when Abraham realized what God was doing. He showed him as a pattern. He told him to sacrifice his only son. And then at the end, he said, God will provide himself, himself the lamb. For the burnt offering. God provided himself as the lamb for the burnt offering. And Abraham saw the gospel on that day. As Jesus said, the father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. He, God tried to make a, a relationship with Israel. He tried to develop this relationship with them. And he failed. Even though he destroyed Egypt led them out and destroyed the entire nation. And of course, in the first presentation, we showed the evidence that this is absolutely historically accurate. God drowned the entire army. He came to him on Mount Sinai. He said, the Lord passed in front of Moses calling out Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger, filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love on thousands of generations and I forgive the iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Those are those three sins that we talked about in the second presentation. Every place, and this is where God gave his law, the Ten Commandments. Now it's interesting, every place 
that the Bible talks about the Ten Commandments being God's law is good, holy, just, true, perfect, not uh, burdensome, light, love, righteous, pure, spiritual. It says the exact same thing about God, that He's good, holy, just. Every characteristic they match simultaneously. As a matter of fact, most people know the old famous verse that God is love. But that's why the Bible says in so many places in the New Testament that the fulfillment of the law is love. See, they're one and the same. The same character. A description of God. Of the character of God. And then, of course, you know, Israel, they sacrificed uh, the golden, they worshiped the golden calf. And their law breaking and their shame broke that covenant of faith. God tried to have a relationship with them and it failed. He, they didn't trust in the character of God. They continued to do the same thing. They're trusting God. Broken over and over and over. And he just says that I want you to be my kingdom of priests. A holy nation. I want you to represent my perfect love to the world. And we, they failed. So God came and he did it himself. Have you ever heard? If you want something done right, do it yourself. That's exactly what God did. God is the one who makes the promises, and he's the one that keeps the promises. This is the good news of the gospel. So let's look at defining the gospel. See, because Richard Dawkins says, if God wanted to forgive sins, why not just forgive them? Who's God trying to impress? Presumably himself, since he's the judge, jury, and, well, execution victim. From a very worldly perspective, I can understand how this might be true. But the gospel explains this dilemma. Let's put on our thinking caps because it's actually not very American. American is very individual and minded. And the gospel is, is corporate in its essence. So the Bible says that the soul who sins shall die. That soul who sins shall die. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. There is not an exchanging of righteousness for lawlessness in the Bible. This is not a supported idea. That's why the gospel and understanding the truth of the gospel is so important. And this is why Paul said that even if an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary to what he's preaching, including the three angels in Revelation, that he is to be accursed from God. Because the truth is, anybody that's not under the everlasting gospel is accursed. Paul says over and over and over in his letters, as a matter of fact, he says 165 times in the New Testament, this concept is in Christ. In Christ, we have righteousness. In Christ, we have salvation. In Christ, we have forgiveness. Everything is in Christ or in Christ Jesus our Lord or in the Lord or in the Lord Jesus or in God or in the Beloved. All these different ways he says in Christ. See, this concept of, of corporatism is taught in the Bible all the way back to Genesis where it says Adam, in Adam, Romans 5.18. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death spread through and death spread through sin. And so death spread to all men. All men died because of one man's transgression. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. Because of one man, Adam's trans trespass, death reigned. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. I, was not, I did not choose to be born a sinner. It's outside of my choice. If my great-grandfather died when he was three, where does that leave me? God. I'm implicated inside my grandpa. This is exactly what the Bible teaches about in Adam. It says the same thing in Hebrews 7, 1 through 10. That Abraham, or that Levi, paid tithe to Melchizedek. 
meaning that the Levitical priesthood was under subjection to the to Melchizedek, which was because his great great grandfather paid tithes, thereby Levi paid tithes in him. If that needs to make sense to you and it doesn't make sense, come see me after and I can explain it better. It also refers to this corporate oneness with Isaac and Rebekah. There were these two babies inside, uh, inside her womb and she went to God and she said, what is going on? Because they're fighting and quarreling and getting into all this destructive uh, interaction with each other. And he said that they are two nations that are in your womb, God said. Not two individuals, two nations. And then it says that the younger will serve the older. And no place in history or in um, the Genesis did that take place except for the nation. Not the individual, the nation, see. Corporate. So what does this mean? Well, in 1 Corinthians 1.30, Ephesians 2.10, and Romans 5.18, says that in the same fashion as Adam did to us, God did to us. So we all are created in Christ Jesus, the Bible says. Every single person who has ever lived has been in Christ when he was born 2,000 years ago. The way I explain it is every single cell has a separate DNA. Every single cell, we have at least 50 trillion cells per person. So each cell has a different DNA strand from a different person. So you and you and you were separate cells in Christ. So that when Christ lived a perfect life, you lived a perfect life in Him. See, Ephesians 2.10 says, we were created in Christ Jesus. By His doing, the Father, you all. Remember I said that God is a, God is a, uh, a country boy at heart? The word here is y'all. The, by the Father's doing, y'all are in Christ. It's not by your choice, but by His choice. Now, it wasn't my choice to be made a sinner, and it wasn't my choice to be put in Christ. But now the destination, your destination, is your choice. For this reason, he had, the Bible says, for this reason, he, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become the merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he, he might make atonement for the sins of the people. So when Jesus lived a perfect life, you lived a perfect life in him. When he helped the poor and reached out and perfectly loved, you perfectly loved in him. His faith stayed strong, even when ours failed. Jesus was faithful where we are not. Jesus kept his faith, and you kept your faith in him. The Bible says that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tested in every way, yet without sin. But he conquered sin. Where you and I fail, he conquered sin, yet he was without sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the deaths and the penalty for sin is death. So we have positive righteousness in Christ Jesus. But at the same time, the penalty for the sins that I have committed is death. But if I'm in Christ, God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So when Christ died on the cross, we died in him. So the negative requirements of the law, death, was fulfilled in Christ. And the righteous requirements of the law was fulfilled in Christ on your behalf. For since by a man came death, by a man came the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die. So also in Christ all will be made alive. And he seated us with him in heaven in Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ has your new DNA up in heaven waiting. 
He wants to give you your new home, your new body, to live a perfect, selfless life. Jesus, it is a true statement. If you want something done right, do it yourself. And God put us in Him. Jesus did it Himself. Ephesians says it this way, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace. He is our peace. Who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And He did this by ending the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. And he brought his good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far off. And peace to the Jews who were near. So the religious and the non-religious have been brought near in Christ. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Not by your doing, by His doing. We are all Christ's family, a part of His body. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so you may know that you have eternal life. God has set us free from our fear. The gospel can set you free. Jesus promised on the Jesus proposed on the cross. Get to know him. Then you will be able to trust him fully with yourself. Jesus says, come unto me, all you are tired and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. So I beg you to please be reconciled with God. This day I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Please choose life. And if you are Christ's and you're not doing anything for him, what on earth? Are you doing for heaven's sake? Don't you know we're at war and people are dying daily? You don't have to be at the front lines. You know, for every one person that's up here, there are 10 behind the scenes. There are financial responsibilities. There are computer responsibilities. There's sound responsibilities. There's prayer responsibilities. Everybody can do something to help move the movement forward. Do something. What are you going to say to Christ when he asks you who you brought with him, who you brought with you with the talents that he gave you? Maybe it's time we got into the Bible, dusted it off, and actually started reading it. Truthlink.org, a great place to go to do Bible studies online. They'll run you right through them. It's great. Never forget that this is eternal life, that you may have a relationship with God. And Jesus Christ, whom he sent. Thank you.